sit down and if you're warm, feel free to take off your jacket, fan yourself with the bulletin, as we say, don't we have air conditioning in this church? Well, yes we do, but unfortunately we also have a compressor that's more than 20 years old that decided to conk out and is in the process of being replaced. So hopefully just one more hot Sunday. This helps you to know what, it's, uh, what it was like before we had the luxury of air conditioning. Well, what did you think of the video by Rob Bell? I have to say that when I watched it, the first part of it, I found it a little bit confusing. Although I've seen it the second time through, I put some of the pieces together. But I really liked the questions that he asked at the end. And I'm going to get to those in just a moment. But just let me put Rob Bell into perspective for you. I wouldn't be surprised if you've heard of Rob Bell, although you may be saying to yourself, now why is that name familiar to me? He's been in the news a great deal lately. He was on the cover of Time Magazine in April. He was on Good Morning America. Because he wrote a book that has become very in the evangelical circles with which he is connected. The name of the book is Love Wins. And I've read it, as I know a couple other people have. And it has some very interesting ideas. But we're not going to focus on that right now. Instead, I want you to think about the questions that he asked at the end of the video. He said, if your life was the only example that people had, and they were asked the question, has Jesus been raised from the dead? Based on your life, what would their answer be? In other words, how do we do when it comes to living out the good news? Do we live as if the power and presence of the resurrected Jesus is around us and within us? Do we act as if we are people who have been forgiven and thus have been transformed? If people looked at our lives, would they be able to say, because of how those people live, I can see that the restoration of God's kingdom has begun. If we found ourselves in a setting that was completely foreign to us, as Paul did in the reading from Acts, how would we be gospel? Be the good news in that place. Today in the gospel, as I mean, not the, in today in the lesson from Acts, as we continue our study of the book of Acts, we jump clear ahead from where we were last week. You may remember that last week, at the very end of the lesson, we were introduced to a man named Saul, who witnessed the martyrdom, the murder. Stephen. And then Saul went on to be a persecutor of the church. But we know him as Paul. He was converted. And in today's reading, he is well on his way to becoming one of the greatest missionaries of the Christian faith. He is on his second missionary journey in today's lesson. And he has left Thessalonica, where there's been some trouble. And so they more or less dropped him off in Athens, Greece. And he's waiting there for his companions, Timothy and Silas, to join him. Now, Paul could have, having arrived in Athens, just seen it as a time to put up his feet and relax, wait for his companions to show up. Great Memorial Day activity. Right? But he doesn't do that. He goes to the synagogue first, where he discusses the faith and the resurrection of Jesus with the Jews 
Gentiles who believe in God. And then he goes into the marketplace, where he engages in debates with the philosophers there. And it says even in scripture that he's discussing, debating with Epicureans and Stoics. Now remember, at this time, Athens was a place where many, many, many people were interested in learning, in philosophy, and in religion. At this time in Athens, there were hundreds, thousands of altars for various idols, various gods. And there were gods for almost everything that Athenians would have done, every aspect of life. And there's even a god called the unknown god, just in case they missed anything. They want to make sure that they cover all their bases. So, in this environment, Paul is in the marketplace debating with the Athenians, with the Stoics and the Epicureans, who are types of philosophers. And they invite him, or they drag him, we're not sure which is the case, because they're intrigued by what he has to say, to the Arapahs, which is a hill which is near the place where the Athenian council meets. It's also a place where the philosophers debate. And they bring him there to speak, we assume, we don't really know for sure, to speak to the council about that which he's been sharing in the marketplace. Now, Paul is no fool. There he is, standing before the council. He doesn't begin by deriding them for all of these idols all over the city. In fact, he begins by telling them that he admires their quest for God their quest for the ground of all being, as he says. But, he tells them, he knows the God that they call unknown. He knows his God. He says, this is the God that has created the world. And having created the heavens and the earth, God does not need a building in which to dwell. This is the God, he says, that breathed life into all creatures, including all human beings, and put them in the countries in which they live. And so being above everything, this God doesn't need human beings to do something in service of God. However, he says, this God wants to draw close to human beings and wants human beings to long for God. Now, Paul's pretty smart. In the midst of this conversation about God, he quotes two Greek poets. And you'll notice he doesn't say anything that is, you know, that the people listening would have found disconcerting or with which they would have disagreed. He's building a rapport with them. But then, he introduces Jesus. And he doesn't introduce Jesus as being one of these various gods and goddesses for which there are idols all over the city. Oh no. Paul says that Jesus is the one will come to judge the world in righteousness. The one above all these others. And why? Why Jesus? Because he's been raised from the dead. Now, N.T. Wright says, and I couldn't help but notice that Rob Bell is basically quoting N.T. Wright, who is a, a theologian. N.T. Wright says that Jesus being raised the dead is not just to show us that Jesus is divine. The reason that Jesus being raised from the dead is so significant is that the world is broken. The world is not what God wants the world to be. And in 
the resurrection of Jesus, we have the first physical example of the world being set right, being restored. So that it is that through Jesus, all of the world and the people in it will be set right, will be restored. So, Paul says to the Athenians, give up your idol ways, particularly your worship of, of all of these idols, and seek instead the living God, the God not made of stone or gold or silver by human art, artistic ability, by human hands, but the God who is the creator. The true God. All of these idols, he says to them, are getting in the way of your finding the true living God. Give them up, he tells them. Well, do they? Our lesson doesn't tell us, but if we were to read a little further, we would find that there were a whole bunch of people who scoffed at Paul. And there were some who said, we would like to hear more. And there were a few who accepted what he was saying and became disciples of Jesus. Okay, we're in the discerning business around here. And the reason we're studying the book of Acts is to discern from the book of Acts what it is that it teaches us about being followers of Jesus. About how it is we're to live out our faith. So what do we learn? this story. Let's, let's just, I can tell you, tell you what we learned about. Six it. See, which one of these going to count? Paul goes to Athens. And his goal is what? His goal in everything is to preach the good news. But when he gets there, he realizes that he has to change his method. He has to change his approach to fit the culture. Otherwise, the people won't listen to him. And so he does that. And as he does it, he does it with the spirit of acceptance, the spirit of affirmation. And yet, he invites his listeners to go further. And he doesn't water down his message. Now, how are we to do that? That's a matter for our discernment, both individually and as a congregation. But let's go back to Rob Bell for a minute, because it's very interesting to me that Rob Bell's church in Michigan is called Mars Hill Church. Why? I went on the website and looked up Mars Hill Church, and all it said was that Mars Hill is the English translation of that hill in Athens where Paul gave this speech that we just have been talking about. And that's all it says. It doesn't give any further explanation as to why this church that was founded in the late 90s is called Mars Hill Church. But I have a guess. And my guess is that it's the very reason that I just said the very things that Paul did that Rob Bell wanted to accomplish in his church, in the church that he started, I should say, the church of Jesus Christ that he started. Which are to go into a Senate, to preach the good news of Jesus Christ in a way that could be heard by that particular culture in a way that was accepting and affirming and yet inviting people to go further and that didn't water down the vital part of the message. The message of grace in Jesus. Now I would say that given the fact that this is a church that was founded in the late 1990s and now has between 7 and 10,000 people attending every Sunday. 
he probably was successful. I went on the website, as I said, and I was very just fascinated by their values, which they call directions. And for every value, there's a symbol, an arrow. And the values are these. Their values are to go backwards, which is to honor the roots of the faith. To go forward, since we are constantly on a journey. To go inward, since our goal is that all humanity would be whole, would be healed and whole. To go, and this isn't the true word, it's pretty creative, with word, because as believers, we have been made to be in community. To go outward, since we are called by Jesus to serve the world, and to go upward, since the goal is for the restoration of the world, through the resurrection of Jesus. Now, I thought that was pretty clever. To have values that you don't even need words for. You just need these symbols to remember what they are. We can get jealous of Bravo and Mars Hill Church. We can admire them. We can come up with all sorts of reasons why, why they are able to do what they're doing and we are not. But that's not the point. The point is this. In this time, in this setting, what do we need to do in order to accomplish what Paul accomplished in Athens? In other words, in order to proclaim the good news of Jesus, what do we need to adjust about our message and our method? How do we need, how can we be affirming and accepting of people who do not know the good news? And yet, invite them to go further without watering down the essential message that we have to share. That's what is before us. It's pretty clear cut what the goal is. The path to that goal we're still discerning. But we'll know that we're heading in the right direction. We're no, we will know that we're on a good path when people can look at our lives and at our church and can say, I can tell by the way those people live that Jesus has been raised.